Catherine Handar Paub, and um, welcome to our session on COVID 19 and the Black and Minority Ethnic Communities and Vaccine Hesitancy. Um, I'm Beth Kidd, I'm the Senior Development Support Manager at Hub Cymru Africa, and um, joined by Matt Wallopu, who is um, one of the trustees at the Wales and Africa Health Links Network. Um, he will be introducing our speakers. Before I hand over to him, um, I'll just do a bit of housekeeping. Um, apologies for those of you who have been in previous sessions, you will have already heard this, but for those of you that are new, um, this event is in a webinar format, so only the panellists um, are able to access their microphones and their cameras, um, and the rest of you are muted. We do want you, however, to participate in the discussions, um, so please feel free to type in the chat box, which you should be able to see to the right of your screen. Um, there's also a Q&A tab there where you can ask questions of the panellists. Um, and we will be uh, leaving time, Mac will be leaving time at the end um, for a few questions from the floor. Um, you can also make an oral contribution. Um, you should see a raise your hand button at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you do that, we will then be able to uh, invite you to unmute yourself so you can ask your question verbally. Um, we really value your feedback. So we will be doing a few polls at the end of the session, um, which will help Hub Cymru Africa and Wales and Africa Health Links Network be more responsive to um, the groups and the people that we support. Um, and finally, just to say that uh, no forms of abuse or offensive language or behaviour in the chat box or throughout the session will be tolerated. Um, so please listen with respect and be mindful of the experiences of others. Um, on that note, I will hand over to uh, Dr. Matt Wallopu, who will be um, chairing the session. Um, although I can see that he's actually not on my screen anymore. So hopefully he's there somewhere in the background um, to be able to introduce the speakers. Mac, are you there? That's fine. I can introduce them Beth. Wonderful. You can. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Zed Savanda, over to you. Prinanda, and good afternoon and welcome everybody. And um, it is a pleasure to welcome you to the afternoon session. And uh, it was really an interesting morning session and I really enjoyed the last session. I'm delighted to be joined by two colleagues and friends, two eminent public specialists that I highly respect. So I will just give you their CV so long, I've tried to make it a little bit brief so that I can spare a bit of time. The first one is Professor Edward Kunonga. He's the Director of Population Health Management at North England Commissioning Support. He's also a consultant in public health for an acute and a mental health trust in the Northeast of England. Edward is a passionate public health professional with knowledge, experience and expertise in population health management and improving health, tackling inequalities in healthcare, both local, regional, and national levels. He's also involved in quite a bit of research, teaching, and learning with a number of universities, with a lot of his work at Teesside University. I've also got Professor Kilechi, Kilechi Noham, and he's a colleague. We work at the same health board, and um, for those who in Wales, the health board is Kumtaf Morganog University Health Board, which covers Rhonda Cannon Taff, Metha Tidwell, and Bridgend. And he's our executive director of public health in the health board. He's also the executive lead for research and development, innovation, and value best health in the health board. And prior to that, he has had a number of NHS and local government posts. He also holds two honorary professorship with Cardiff and Plymouth universities. And Kelechi tells me that he has recently also been elected as co-chair of the Southwest Global Health Collaboration. I know that both Kelechi and Edward have been heavily involved recently with the response to COVID pandemic in their own organization. And I know Edward has been involved with a lot of diaspora groups with consulting international and also a lot of committees in his home country of Zimbabwe. And Kelech has done much the same. I've been on webinars with him with the Muslim Doctors of Wales. He has been on Radio Wales. So he's very busy. And he has recently been also invited to give a speech in the Midlands, all related to his expertise. So thank you guys and welcome. Next slide. <clears throat> So I think this is the blab we have. I think really we wanted to, to cover the area of um, COVID pandemic, which has had a significant impact on every aspect of our lives. 
I know that some of you might have had a personal experience, lost loved ones, and we need to be conscious of that. And hopefully we can be sensitive in the way the subject is held. And uh, we are going to tackle some difficult themes, and uh, but I hope that we can be very positive about it and come up with some dedicated themes of action at the end. Next slide. Next slide. So this is the main area that we want to, to cover. So I'm hoping that Kilech and Edward will help me to go back. We've all looked at the statistics, a lot of issues, remember, related to all this, but I'm hoping that we can unpick all this going forward. Next slide. We've all seen this very important report which was done by MPs and it did a lot of things that were highlighted on that in terms of lessons learned to debt. And I'm hoping from the summary of information that we analyze today, we might be able to see the positives, the negatives, and see whether we can have a plan of action going forward. Next slide. And uh, I think the key things is that there were some positives in the report, but also there was some very serious mistakes. I think there were key things that were highlighted, transparency, international representation, and I think it's something that we can take on board with our links as well. But also very important, there was comment about structured challenge. And I think the idea that if you are doing something, you really should not be marking your own homework. Next slide. So early in the pandemic, it became quite clear that people from black and ethnic minorities were disproportionately impacted than other areas. Next slide. There were three main groups that were highlighted in terms of being disproportionately affected. And I think one big one, which we are going to deal with today is the BEM group, which is the black Asian and minority groups. There's also a group of people with learning disabilities. I'm a pediatrician and I work with a lot of disabilities, including young adults, but also low income groups. And today we're gonna to be touching the BEM group, but also the low income groups and college will be trying to understand whether these areas cross over as well. Next slide. Next slide. <clears throat> right. I'm hoping in a lot of sessions in medicine, I think these courts would be very, very appropriate. And we all want to use evidence-based medicine. Everything that we do must be supported by evidence and data. But the more we have been doing issues, particularly related to vaccine hesitance, we have realized how complex the issue is. And uh, quite a few times when it's very clear that one plus one is two, quite a few people get very convinced that one plus one is three. So I'm hoping that we can talk about why things like that are happening. And we'll start with Edward trying to give us a little bit of a perspective in terms of statistics UK-wide in terms of the deaths of BMA community. Next slide. Over to you, Edward. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, uh, Zed, for uh, the warm introduction and uh, the invitation to join your fantastic conference. You're doing some great things uh, and also delighted to be sharing the platform with a colleague uh, and an inspiring and inspirational public health leader in uh, in Kalechi. We we have networked. Uh, the pandemic has kind of put us apart, so hopefully this uh, reignites our connections uh, from the time when he was in Plymouth uh, to when he then uh, jumped ship and joined you in in Wales. You are in very safe hands. I couldn't think of anyone better uh, to be leading the uh, COVID nineteen response. So. Um, yeah, he comes highly commended, not only from me, but from people from the public health profession. So yeah, Zed did talk about uh, the issue around the pandemic, and and I, I won't I won't bore you with uh, a lot of statistics. Although the temptation is there, uh, as a public health person, we always bring lots of data with us. But the the pandemic and its impact could have been predicted. It, it's very very predictable, uh, the way it has played out. Uh, and the way it has affected people and the way it will continue to affect people's lives is very, very predictable. 
uh, it has followed the fracture lines uh, that existed before the pandemic. And, and one of the very vivid uh, descriptions that someone used for me that has captured it is that the COVID-19 has compressed the timeline and everything has happened within a space of eight to 16 weeks for some people. But if you take out that compression of timeline, the inequalities uh, by ethnicity in this point uh, are very much well rehearsed. We are very much aware of that, that people from Black, Asian, minority ethnic groups not only had shorter lives, but they also spend a greater part of their shorter lives living, living with chronic disease. And that is what the, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, took advantage of. It followed the fracture lines of those who were already vulnerable and those who were at risk and then made uh, the situation worse for them. And the reason why these people were at a greater risk is, is not genetic. We know some people might have some conspiracy theories. It is about uh, the exposure, the risk of exposure, and the social conditions in which they, uh, they find themselves in. Health inequalities are socially produced, they are systemic, uh, they are unjust, and they are avoidable. And most of these deaths could have been avoided. And I hope that in our recovery, we do the best we can to avoid the consequences which we can sit here uh, and recite. So when you look at the cross-section of uh, the impact of the pandemic, right from the number of cases that we saw in the early days to those who were then converted into uh, hospitalization because of severe disease, and then sadly, ultimately, uh, to those who ended up in intensive care and those who ended up with poor outcomes. A very, very clear and telling picture around the fracture lines that were existing before. So it's not a surprise that we see uh, that the first 10 NHS staff to die were from uh, Black, Asian, and minority ethnic groups. And as this progressed, we saw a disproportionately higher percentage uh, of deaths from uh, staff from a Black, Asian, and minority ethnic groups compared uh, to the um, indigenous populations, if you like. And that was not just by uh, accident. That was just following the fracture lines that we have known for a long time uh, have existed within healthcare. We know the level of discrimination. We know uh, the issues with regards to not having a voice. Uh, we know the issues with regards to low-come work, with regards to zero-hours contracts. And we did some work uh, looking at the experiences of Zimbabwean healthcare workers who were on the front line and came to the conclusion that, again, uh, in the same pattern uh, that the pandemic had then just followed those fracture lines and those staff who felt disenfranchised, who didn't have a voice in the workplace, could not uh, demand the PPE, could not challenge being redeployed, despite them being at a greater risk, ended up sadly uh, being affected. But that was not just limited uh, to staff within health uh, healthcare. We know within the care industry, we saw the same pattern. And we also know within the community, as the pandemic progressed, we started seeing as the levels of community exposure increased a similar pattern. So there is a report by Public Health England done by a colleague of uh, Kelechi and myself uh, called Kevin Fenton, uh, which goes into a lot more detail uh, around uh, the greater prevalence uh, and the greater risk uh, of mortality um, amongst Black, Asian, minority ethnic groups. And all of that could have been prevented. Uh, all of that could have been avoided. Uh, and the fact that it was systemic across sectors just highlights that this issue is not limited to one sector, but is an issue that we need to think about in terms of how we protect uh, our populations going forward. Thank you. Uh, Beth, can you move to slide 18? Kelech, I think you're going to give us a perspective from Wales now and a bit nearer home and also maybe give us some perspective of Kumtaf and also where deprivation fits into this equation. Yes, so thank you very much, um, Zed, first of all, for um, your role in organizing this. I think like I echo uh, Edward in, in saying incredible work that you're doing. And so I'm very delighted to be here. And um, uh, Edward, it's lovely to, to see you, even if it is virtually, and you were very gracious in your introduction. So I, I hope I can rep reciprocate that by saying it's been a pleasure working with you, knowing you, and uh, 
and fantastic to be sharing the platform with you. So um, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone, once again. I think um, as, as Professor Kononga has just described, a lot of the impact of COVID uh, across our communities, and I think it's just worth just um, um, expressing some, some thoughts, you know, just sharing thoughts with families across our communities all across the country who have suffered losses um, from, from COVID in the past nearly two years. It's been very challenging. As someone re reminded me, there's hardly any part of our communities that you will go to now that you won't see people who have either suffered COVID or known people who have been lost to COVID during this past two years. So our thoughts are very much with them. Um, the, the three local authorities that um, are in Kuntaf Moor Ganog, uh, that's Bridgend, Rhonda Kanantaf, and Method Sidville, they've seen some of the highest incidents of COVID and also mortality from COVID. And our city, Rhonda Kanantaf, has definitely had the highest mortality rate of pretty much any local authority uh, across Wales. Um, over this last 18 months or, or thereabouts. So what this map is demonstrating is it's one thing to look at the Welsh rates, but actually, as with every average, averages always hide variability. And it's important to look at the variability in the experiences of, um, so these are LSOs across Wales and the, and the cumulative incidents and, and, um, and mortality rates rather from, from COVID. So our two local authorities in our city and Methotidville have seen some of the highest rates, particularly Rhonda Kanantaf. If we move on to the next slide. So I think the next slide will, um, will show um, a more quantitative data in terms of de death rates per 100,000. But according to latest figures, there it says 12th of May and, and um, more recent figures would demonstrate that that really hasn't changed with our city um, still topping pretty much the league table across Wales in terms of mortality. If we move on to the next slide, um, you could almost say that um, if you look at COVID, if you, if, you, if you could stand in March 2020 and look into the crystal ball and say, how do you think the communities across Wales are going to experience COVID? You could pretty much predict that COVID would follow the fault lines of pre-existing underlying vulnerabilities, whether those vulnerabilities are uh, deprivation, socioeconomic deprivation, a health deprivation, the, the, the preponderance or the aggregation of long-term conditions in some parts of our communities. We have some of the highest rates of deprivation um, in, 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 in Wales, in some of our communities, in Rhonda, Canada, from Methotidville. In terms of the preponderance of long-term conditions, one of the highest prevalences of long-term conditions. So in a sense, the factors that made uh, um, vulnerability to COVID quite significant are clustering in our communities. So you could almost predict that the communities in Comtaf Morgana would have had some of the highest rates. And what this data is looking at is the um, the rates of COVID diagnosis or COVID incidents by deprivation. And, and what strikes you here, immediately looking at this data, is the fact that pretty much across all of the deprivation categories, except in quintile four, um, men were more likely to suffer COVID, to catch COVID in the first place compared to women. And then there was a very clear socioeconomic gradient where you are more likely to catch COVID if you're more deprived and less likely to catch COVID if you're less deprived. And the same pattern, when you look in the next slide, uh, so this is looking at the incident, the next slide is gonna look at mortality and essentially the same pattern. But I think one of the things that also strikes you with this is how that men are more likely to die from COVID um, than women. So the gap in terms of um, men and women, in terms of mortality is much wider than the gender gap in terms of incidents. So in a sense, COVID didn't like men. And, and, we, and we, we know that there are many factors that COVID didn't like. COVID didn't like overweight and obesity. COVID didn't like diabetes. COVID didn't like men. And, and COVID didn't like a number of long-term conditions. So anyone who had uh, the aggregation of these variables was more likely not just to catch COVID, but also to experience either escalation of care with COVID or to suffer adverse outcomes like mortality. And next slide. Um, 
and, and so this one is a very interesting slide because what this what this does this data is looking at um, mortality from COVID um, during um, uh, I think the period from May uh, from March to May 2020, looking at the numbers of deaths registered um, during that period, and then comparing that to the numbers of deaths registered. To the same uh, to the to the similar periods between 2014 and 2018, and essentially what it's done is that it's arranged this in terms of people's countries of birth. Now, country of birth um, does correlate with ethnicity. It is not the same thing as ethnicity, but it does give you an indication of ethnicity. And what you can see here, very striking, that during that period. Um, uh, of March March to May 2020, you know, the people who were born in England were one and a half times more likely to have died during that period compared to the 2014 to 18 period. But actually, if you were born in Central and Western Africa, you are nearly four and a half times to have died uh, during during that period compared to the 2014 to 2018 period. Now, that is a stark uh, data, because like I said, it does not necessarily correlate perfectly with ethnicity, but it is an indication um, because what this data is looking at is is place of birth. Now I know we're going to uh, unpick this a little more in the course of the next couple of slides, but this is just a um, a moment of uh, pause and take this in. I think that's the last of my slides, uh, Zed. I, I yes, believe. I think that's the main areas in terms of the the data related to death. We wanted to move on to hesitance and obviously some of the themes will cross over again. If we go to the next slide and then maybe towards the end, we can discuss some of the issues related to that. I just wanted to touch on three things related which are touched on. I think one of them is we should always remember some success stories. I think one of the things that happened when people were talking about BEM deaths, people felt that we need to do risk assessments. And I think Wales were really in the forefront for this. And I think we did a fairly good job about that. And I think this was taken on. And I think the Welsh Assembly government needs to be commended for that. And the, the committee that did, did a fairly good piece of work. Yeah. And I think on the whole, this was embedded. There was some disappointment with some of us at the time that initially it was, it was published. Actually, some health boards actually were not really taking it seriously. I remember we did a survey and some occupational health professionals really didn't know, which suggested that sometimes you can do a very good piece of work, but unless you mandate and follow it up, it's not put in place. But I get the impression that overall, this is something that seems to be working very well. I don't know whether Kelech, you want to comment at all about the risk assessment tool. Yeah, eventually the risk assessments tool proved to be very useful. But I mean, some of the hesitance that you talked about um, uh, was was not very um, impressive. But ultimately, we 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 got there, and how powerful that that risk assessment tool was, and and more than the tool, I think it's the process and the culture of recognizing that this is not just. Um, an incidental finding. There is a real predisposition for people from our ethnic extractions uh, in terms of um, not only the risk of COVID, but also poor outcomes from COVID. And that risk assessment process, culture, and tool became a vital element of our collective response to, to, to COVID, particularly as it affected people from our Black, Asian, minority ethnic groups. Edward, when we were talking, I think in England, it wasn't as successful. And I think you were a bit skeptical in some areas where that I think mandating it might have made a big difference. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So really uh, welcome the introduction of the risk assessment tool because it allowed you to take into account all the factors that Kalechi started off in his introductory remarks. Uh, so we were getting lots of evidence uh, in terms of who was getting severe disease, who was ending up with poor outcomes, uh, and sadly, who was dying. Uh, and, and we knew this, um, and, and you could argue that the risk assessments, whilst very welcome, the, the delay in introducing them uh, led to some preventable uh, illness and sadly, uh, some preventable deaths. I think the England experience is probably different from your Welsh experience. 
Uh, there was lots of variation in how this was being put into practice. Lots of variation. Any risk assessment is a great start, but it's what you do with the risk assessment. How do you mitigate the risk and how do you control it? And we, when we ran our community Zoom sessions, we used to find people who would say, the risk assessment has said I'm at very high risk, but my manager is redeploying me. Uh, and the fact that they were being run within the NHS and perhaps not as consistently within the care industry uh, meant that those people working in care homes perhaps left were left uh, without the same level of protection. So whilst we do welcome, and exactly as you've highlighted, Zed, uh, that policy is great, uh, but there is a gap between policy and implementation. Uh, and if there is no follow-up, which then says, can you report back how many you have done? Are you getting coverage of the people who are at risk? And is the risk management being consistently applied? Sadly, you can have a brilliant policy, uh, but a variation uh, in terms of how it's being implemented and the protection uh, that it could have covered uh, those people who are at risk. Thank you. Next slide. Kelech, in our recent uh, management meeting, there was a very good report from a BEM group, which is extremely successful. And I would dare to say it's probably the most successful group in Wales at the moment. It is doing very well. And I think people are finding it very, very helpful. But I just want comments from both of you how clustering all these statistics under the umbrella of BEM, how useful is it to make sensible interpretation of, of these statistics? Shall we start with you, Edward? <clears throat> Yeah, so so I think, I mean, as a public health professional, I, I would be true to my profession if I didn't say we, we, we really value having access to data, we like to segment, we like to profile, we like uh, to lump things into groups so that we can start to derive meaning, uh, look at the relationship between variables. Uh, that is all well and good. But I think one of the challenges with uh, when you're dealing with a, a community that is not homogenous is that you could make some sweeping assumptions uh, on characteristics and on relationships between variables that are not transferable when you start thinking at individual level. So you need to have the flexibility and the agility that enables you to carry out the population level analysis that you would lose if you were just to look at individual groups, because some of them are very, very small and you cannot derive meaning out of that. But at the same time, uh, this is shouldn't just be about the data. It is also about the stories and understanding the context in which people live. So, so I think, I mean, there's been a big debate around whether BAME is a useful uh, or a useful reference or it's a hindrance. I think in terms of some of the population level planning, the statistical analysis, you get the power because you now got a bigger sample size. But I think within that is the risk that you then make sweeping statements and you, you risk missing the heterogeneous nature of, of these communities. I mean, even to say black African, I mean, Africa is massive uh, and, and you can make sweeping statements against what is accepted by one community and you find that it doesn't work with another community. So I think it's a good starting point. It allows us to plan. It allows us to derive meaning or to derive theories. But I think it should always be uh, treated with the same level of caution uh, and valuing people and going out and speaking to them. Uh, and so I was delighted. I mean, I've been following uh, Kelechi's posts on the social media uh, that the interaction is not just about the data. There are people in all of these numbers. And as public health professionals, we need to get out there and understand the context so we avoid generalizing and making sweeping statements. Kelech, I think you are doing a talk on this quite soon. And uh, also, I also think you should mention the success of our group because you are our champion in the exec. Indeed. I mean, it would almost be so sinful for me to add anything to what Edward has said, because he's been so articulate and really hit the nail on the head in terms of so completely agree. I mean, I think, uh, you know, the as I said earlier, with averages, any any average tends to hide variability. It's the same thing with the terminology BME, 
and the variability of experience and the variability of determinants of those experiences within that that really heterogeneous group can very easily be lost in in the in a in a simple appellation of BME. So so I won't say any more on because I, I, um, Edward has covered it very very helpfully. But, but you you also right Zed. I mean I, I feel very proud of our BME network in Kumtaf Morgano University Health Board and and thanks to yourself and other colleagues for innovating that network and the incredible work that is going on, which I've been very privileged to, to be able to, to champion in, in our board and, and to support. Thank you. Next slide. Right. Now the even more controversial subject of vaccine hesitancy. Next slide. <clears throat> right. We know that probably out of all the things that have happened with COVID, that uh, vaccination has been the most successful component of the United Kingdom's response. And this is actually a statement from that report that I highlighted earlier. I just put those two issues that whenever I teach medical students and junior doctors, I always put uh, vaccines as number two and always ask that if I'm going to go to the Congo, what, what else would be more effective in terms of public health? And the only other thing that we know in terms of public health that is more evidence-based is water. I know I'm talking to, to professors in public health, they might contradict me, but that's what I've always said. So next slide. This is an interesting one. We all know that we've had a pandemic of COVID, but we've also had a pandemic of disinformation and deliberate sowing of misinformation. And I think that's been very clear to everyone. Next slide. I think people get quite emotional about these things. And uh, I don't even want to read that, but this is the other extreme. Next slide. We have all seen this. Next slide. It's very interesting, actually, that a colleague received a very similar letter to one of these. I won't give you any detail, but one of the consultant colleagues received a letter from, from the family in the very similar vein to what's there. I think there's you can read all those things for yourselves. But the last bit also is very, very important is that this group of people are actually very good at recruiting. And there's evidence that it's more than 500%. I started with this because really that's not what we are going to be discussing today. Next slide. I wanted to put this because not so much in this country, but some of us who have been working and I'm sure Edward will agree with me that the same group of people that are very anti-vax to some extent are very pro-interventions where there's very little evidence. Started with chloroquine. We have had a lot of this, particularly in Southern Africa, in Zimbabwe, in South Africa, and this is linked to some groups in America where people were phoning me and saying, Zed, can we take some ivermectin? I said, pause, Let's. what can happen? But what I also found is that you should never stop, don't do it. You should also try and reason with people. People never want to be told, don't do something. They want you to try and explain where you are. Next slide. Edward, try and make sense of this and put a, lower the temperature a little bit. Uh, thanks, thanks for that. So, so in the course of the um, COVID-19 uh, second wave, um, we, we were quite fortunate that as we approached Christmas, we started receiving the good news that um, vaccines were going to be rolled out uh, and the processes were going ahead of um, seeking emergency use powers uh, for these vaccines to be rolled out uh, across populations. And suddenly there was uh, a growth in uh, in all types of information. And, and, and as I was preparing for this, I came across this very useful, uh, well, certainly for me, it helped me to break down the different types of information that was circulating. And initially I thought this is a play with words until I kind of went through and kind of had to sit down and, and understand uh, the different types of information disorders, as they call it, very well recognized, especially uh, aligned with uh, political campaigns and elections, uh, that there is often three types of uh, information disorders, and they differ 
uh, by the extent of falseness and also the intent to harm. The, the intent to harm as you move from the left of your screen to the right is less on the extreme left and increases as that becomes much, much red. So the misinformation is unintentional mistakes such as inaccurate photo captions, uh, dates, statistics uh, that are unintentional. Uh, but sometimes it can be intentional, but with the desire to just create jobs. We have seen all these in social media, someone's face is put on top of somebody else's body. Uh, and, and when we all laugh about this and there's no intent to harm, it's just joking, satire. Uh, then it moves to the next degree, which is about disinformation. So this is deliberately fabricated and manipulated either audio or visual content with the intention to create conspiracy. So the people who are in this disinformation cycle, are, they know what they're doing. It is deliberate and they're creating conspiracy so that they start rumors. Then the extreme end is malinformation, where there is deliberate publication of information for personal uh, or corporate gain rather than the public interest. And, and so th there's lots of examples around this. Uh, the deliberate change of context, the dates, the time of genuine content. And so throughout the pandemic, we have seen three, all these three types. So we have seen kind of jokes about the vaccine and, and people joking about it and they laugh and there's no intent to harm. But we have seen some conspiracies being brewed up based on uh, kind of things that don't add up. Scientifically, it just doesn't make sense. So people will tell you the vaccine causes this. Well, it can't. It, it basically can't. There is no biological process for which it could do that. So the things like it affects your DNA, well, it can't because of, of how it works. Uh, but the disinformation, and then they'll pull out someone who is an expert, and I used to describe these as uh, graduates out of the invest of YouTube, Facebook, and WhatsApp. Uh, suddenly, there are authorities uh, talking about these issues. So that's the disinformation. But the dangerous side is the malinformation, where people are really deliberate and they know what they're doing. So they would misquote statistics. They would replay things like the uh, the yellow card scheme, which is a scheme that raises alerts. So anyone who has got any anything that they feel after the vaccine would raise this and it is published. And so they would use that and misconstrue it to say, look, you're not being told the truth. Look at all these people who are reporting side effects and actually this thing is not safe. So they will take something which is true and valid, but twist it to suit and to meet uh, their ulterior objectives, which is the intent to harm. And so I think throughout the pandemic, we have seen a whole lot uh, of all these things and which meant People who are generally not vaccine hesitant, generally the majority of the population, they are actually pro-vaccinations. And people take their kids to be vaccinated without wanting to know what's in it, without wanting to know where it was manufactured, how long it took. But suddenly because of the social media and the access to all of this confusing information, people started getting very hyped up. Even those people who the previous day had taken their baby for vaccination suddenly are asking questions. So I think we, we had the parallel pandemic, as Simon Stevens put it, which was the pandemic of SARS-CoV-2, and then we had the pandemic of misinformation. And the damage that that has caused is significant, and it undermines not only the COVID-19 response, but has the risk of undermining our public health efforts. And I think sometimes from a public health point of view, we are riding on the basis that people are pro-vaccines, that perhaps in hindsight, we didn't do as much as we should have done uh, to reassure people around this. And some of us did that, but I think it was a little bit and a little too late. And I sit here in the Northeast of England, we've got some communities where vaccine uptake, COVID-19 vaccine uptake is as low as 30%. I attended a funeral two weeks ago of someone who died from COVID-19 who refused to be vaccinated. His death could have been prevented. And I think for those people like that, we moved in way, way too late and the harm had been done. Thank you. I think you've covered the next slide a bit. I think this next slide is more about the spectrum, really. 
in terms of that the vast majority of people will accept vaccines and some will accept with doubts. And yeah. then there is really, we are not going to touch about the anti-vax who are very, very dangerous, but a very small group of people who are, who are there. Next slide. <clears throat> I just wanted to touch about one of the key things that keep coming up in a lot of the webinars which are there, because we know that people are asking about hesitance and things like that. And one of the things that keeps coming up, particularly in the black community, is their trust that the system is, is, is failing them. And, uh, and I think it's also true that the statistics confirm that, that on the whole, things are not, and I think, both Edward and Kelech have already gone through in terms of what they were talking about. And I think this is one of the summary that is quite recent. This came out just last month in terms of certain areas. I'll just highlight maybe two. I think one of them is the maternity one, which I follow very closely. And that hasn't moved significantly for a very long time. But it's not always easy to know why that is the case. But we also know the other one that I feel very passionate because it crosses over with some of the work that I do is psychiatry. And we know that in psychiatry that there is a very disproportionate number of black men being sectioned. And um, there is a complex number of things that, that are related to that. I don't want us to spend too much time. I don't know if Kelechi you want to have any other specific comment on any of the issues on this slide. <clears throat> No, just very quick, quickly to uh, add to that, um, Zed. I think you're you're absolutely right. We know that um, the way ethnicity interacts with um, inequalities and socioeconomic disadvantage can be very complex. Um, so, uh, you know, people from our you know black, Asian, and minority ethnic groups are not the only groups to experience socioeconomic disadvantage. But the way our ethnicity interacts with factors that drive socioeconomic disadvantage are peculiar and oftentimes um, there is there are questions to be asked about how much the wider system in which we operate in has recognized those complex interactions I, I'll say that and I'll pick on one of the items in your in your slide again just for this for the purpose of balance you know that element that says five percent of of blood donors are from black and minority ethnic groups and um uh, combine that with another data that says I mean, one of the questions i was asked in earlier days of this is why was why was there a disproportionate um representation of people from black and asian minority ethnic groups in the covid research trials covid vaccine trials well actually the answer is because people from our communities don't participate in research enough so uh, there is something for me about part of the messaging has also got to be for me and for people from my communities that there, there is also some degree of responsibility on our part i know so if, if we're not if only five percent of people from our communities are giving blood we've got to look at that and take that on the chain and say it works both ways there's something for the system to do but there is also something for us to do because the fact that there were not enough people from our communities represented in the COVID vaccine research uh, trials wasn't new. It was reflective of a systemic lack of engagement from our communities in, 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 in research. So I, I, I think it's important that we get that balancing of the messaging. Otherwise, it comes across like um, the system just needs to do more for us. That is true. But we also need to do something in terms of engaging with the system in a different way than we have done before. Thank you. Next slide. I think one of the things that comes from webinars, I think there's some webinars that we did, I think I think you were there, Edward, is that you tend to get examples of some very difficult historical work, which people tend to quote, which is true, which also means that we have to acknowledge it. But also we need, as you said, to look at it and maybe move on. And one of the ones that keep coming up for people that haven't read this is the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis. I've just summarized it here. I'm not going to spend too much time in it. Basically, this is a study which had a duration of 40 years and which was done in Alabama where 400 African-American men with tertiary syphilis were enrolled. And there was an incentive for free medical care lunch they were not informed that they had tertiary syphilis and that they were being informed that they were being treated for bad blood, a common term for general things. 
And um, actually, initially, the frame was that it was going to be six to eight months, but the study lasted 40 years. But what's very disturbing is that actually during that period from around about 1941, a lot of black Americans started being involved in the Second World War. Treatment for venereal diseases started in 1943, but the study was not reviewed. Penicillin became standard for treatment of syphilis. In 1945, the study was not reviewed. There were the Nuremberg Code, which happened because of the studies that happened by the in the Jewish things in the Nazis, nothing was done. And there was the declaration of Helsinki with a lot of participation of America in terms of informed consent and nothing happened. And this was a study which had very senior medical doctors. And uh, I suppose it's another thing, I'm sure there's a lot of other colleagues out there who sometimes think that we play a victim mentality. Actually, actually these things have happened. So people need to acknowledge that as well. I think we will move on, maybe, unless any of you want to make any comment at all on this, but I think it's just something. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> right, Pete, can you play those two, two videos, please? As a local counselor and also as a nurse, I was reluctant when the vaccine first um, came out. So I'll, I'll put my hand up because I'm absolutely in agreement with True that the, 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 the Asian, the Black and African Caribbean community were disproportionately affected by the virus in the first place. And let's face it, if you're from an ethnic minority group, originally the, the side effects, if you um, contracted the virus, were far worse. So. I did have some reservations. The problem I feel the community have, and, and true is spot on because this is what I'm hearing time and time again. It's not that they are, don't want the vaccine. It's that they want questions answered. You know, you've got your 20 to 39 year olds. A few days ago, we had something um, telling us that if you're pregnant, they advise us not to take the vaccine. But there are people between the ages of 20 to 39 that want to get pregnant in a few years, mm. but they cannot tell us what that will mean for that group if they want to have babies. You've got people that are saying, well, they've not managed to, to cure AIDS or they've not managed to cure cancer, but they've, they've managed to find a vaccine for this virus in less than 10 months. OK. And don't believe it. So for me, we have to look at ways of educating the community, not right. demonising them. Uh, just before we come to Hillary... Yeah, next one. Dean, scepticism exists. Why the reluctance and resistance to have this jab? Well, all the communities are different, but some of the issues they have in common include believing myths and historical misbeliefs that have been fueled by what people are watching and listening to on these. This vaccine is experimental on the human race. Social media videos containing disturbing and false information have spread within some communities. Reverend Mbongay says for many they have exacerbated mistrust that stems from a long legacy of medical mistreatment. We found that the black community has had a disproportionate um, experience around the experimentation of medic medicine on our community. So people need to start feeling confident, not only about the vaccine, but about the ethical practices of medicine in relation to our community. I think you would recall there was even a friend, two French scientists who have alluded to the fact that it's all right to test some vulnerable parts of Africa where we might, they might get a bit more um, experimental opportunities. That should not happen. Right. So we're going to try and share the slides again. So I think, Kelech, you're going to take us through a few slides coming up, starting just trying to define for us what is vaccine hesitance. And then there's a few slides that you're going to include in statistics in Wales. So, so yeah, um, so vaccine hesitancy is very, very simply put, is, is about some degree of uncertainty or ambivalence about the about vaccination that are expressed by individuals and communities 
uh, some of the most common models of vaccine hesitancy talk about three things, which are complacency, confidence, and convenience, essentially. So people are complacent and or might feel, or I, I'm not very confident about, about that. They may have questions about safety, long-term safety profile, immediate side effects. Um, I think what we saw in some of those videos, so those long-standing issues of trust um, and, and and social capital, really, between Black uh, uh, and Asian minority ethnic communities and institutions of government or institutions of authority and influence. We cannot deny the fact that so many things have gone wrong. I mean, you, you spoke very eloquently about the Tuskegee trial. Uh, the first time I came into contact with, you know, I read about the Tuskegee trial was incidentally my first year in medical school several years ago. And, you know, it had such an impact on me. So I, I think when people make references to those things that make them not to be supremely confident in, in, uh, in public authorities and institutions and government, we cannot dismiss it with a wave of the hand. We've got to acknowledge that those are factors that are influencing vaccine hesitancy in some of our communities. But like the lady said in one of the videos, you've got to answer the questions. You've got to engage with people. And hopefully that's part of what is going on um, this afternoon uh, and, and has been going on for some time now. If we move on to the next slide. Um, so the, here, the, here's just some data um, on vaccine hesitancy amongst black communities been so odds ratio of 12.96 compared to white ethnic background. And if I just hack back to one of the points we made earlier about um, when you, you describe the BME group almost as a homogeneous group, actually, if you look at vaccine hesitancy, that uh, odds ratio of 12.9 compared to white ethnic background in black communities is much higher than what we find in other BME um, groups. So I think there is something about just recognizing those variabilities, even within what would ordinarily look like a, a homogeneous group. And uh, uptake in Black, Asian, mixed, and other groups was 71.5% uh, in this time period on the slide compared to 85.6. So that's, that is, what is that? That is, um, you know, quite a significant um, distance or, or difference in uptake of the vaccination by ethnic, by ethnic group. And I made reference to that last most recent data from Wales, suggesting a 26 percentage points gap in the uptake of the second COVID vaccine dose in, um, in 30 to 39 year olds who are of white ethnicity compared to people from, of, of black ethnicity. That is massive. So we have our vaccine equity committee in Wales that I've had the privilege of chairing. And that's, that that's just describes one of our major challenges that the vaccine equity committee is trying to, um, to, to, to tackle. Next slide. So in terms of the reasons for vaccine equity, uh, vaccine hesitancy, I, I talked about the model of complacency, confidence and convenience. But I think one thing to just bear in mind is some of the data might be artifactual. I think this is minor, but I think it's just worth recognizing because we depend on the data um, to, to tell us who, who is who. And, and we know that ethnicity data is not very perfectly coded within the, within the NHS. And then if you're from a, a BAME uh, group, you are more likely to experience a change of address uh, as a migrant. You know, so here we've got migration, we've got ethnicity, and we've got um, so some degree of social instability. And we cannot deny the impact of that, that element in terms of some of that data being artifactual. But I, I do have to stress that the artifact is a minor point because actually most of it is very, very real. There are genuine concerns, as we heard from some of those videos, about side effects and long-term effects. And, and um, Edward described very articulately, you know, the, 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 the pandemic, the second pandemic of misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. And a lot of that is, is underpinning some of the, some of the um, vaccine hesitancy that we've seen in some of our communities. Next, Next slide. I think that's yours again. Yeah, so I mean, they, uh, and this again goes back to one of the points I was making. And uh, are the questions is a good question? Are the questions different? So when people say, "Well, I'm not sure about these vaccines," I'm, I'm vaccine hesitant. Uh, the, uh, the factors that drive vaccine hesitancy 
in the black African community, for example, are they different from the factors that drive vaccine hesitancy in the um, Asian uh, community? And I use the word Asian, you know, just very mindful that that is, my goodness, that's an incredibly broad group. So, and, and I think the quick answer to the question is no, they are very different. And so understanding the drivers of hesitancy uh, in those communities and, and going um, hyper-local, um, I, I, for me, I think it's it's extremely important. Religious, the, the effects, I, I mean, I'm, as, a, as a Pentecostal Christian, I am very, very mindful that the questions that the average Pentecostal Christian who is Black African like myself asks about the vaccines, fundamentally different from the sort of questions that uh, a, an Asian Muslim, for example, might ask. And we describe it at the end of the day, you know, it's all hesitancy, but I think it's really, really important to understand the variability in the drivers of those of that hesitancy. Um, can you go to slide 46? This is the big one. Did we rush it, Kelechi? We did it in, in just over a year. We've been waiting for the malaria vaccine for, for decades. It's it's a it's a fascinating one, and the the simple answer was that um, we 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 got these vaccines ready quickly. We've got to own up to that and celebrate it. Actually, we did it quickly, but did doing it quickly mean that we cut corners? Emphatically, not. So the the reason why it was done quickly was the emergency nature of this meant that governments suddenly put a lot of funding into it. Once China had, had um, got the genome of this virus, it was shared internationally, allowing researchers in every part of the world to, to get onto, um, you know, um, working on the vaccines, okay? Um, so funding, uh, international sharing of data and the fact that I'll give the example of the mRNA um, uh, vaccines. People say, well, the mRNA is a new technology. Well, actually, the mRNA technology was developed in, in Philadelphia more than 20 years ago. So there is nothing new about the mRNA technology. The only thing new about the mRNA technology was, it, was its application in the development of the COVID vaccines. But the mRNA technology, as I said, was developed in Philadelphia more than 20 years ago. So again, this is part of the misinformation and disinformation in there. So um, these vaccines went through the normal phases of trials. I think phase one to five of trials, and none of those um, were, uh, were sidestepped. It was done quickly because everything came together, including funding and international collaborations to get us there more quickly than would have been the previous experience. I just want you to comment the last one. I know you might have to leave us quite quickly yourself. So I wanted you to comment. There's a big area about fertility, about having children, about if you just want to comment on that. And then there's areas that I think Edward will comment when you run away. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm, I'm really sorry that I have, have, have to, I have to leave just around in the next minute or year about. But uh, allow me to comment on this fertility one because it's, a, it's an important question. So why do people think some people think that covid vaccines might affect your your the fertility of a woman or, or perhaps even the fertility of a man and the reason why this myth came about was this and some of this is going to go back to the points um professor kunanga was making earlier about how disinformation and misinformation arises so the, there is a protein um and, and you know proteins are made of amino acids so there is a protein called syncytin one in, in that enables the placenta to, to attach to the womb of a pregnant woman, okay? So essentially important to sustain pregnancy. That protein called syncytin one shares a few amino acid sequences with the spike protein of the coronavirus. Now, so this is classically how this information arises. Somebody starts with something that is factual and then gives it an extension and a logical derivation that completely results in it being false. So someone sat down and gone, hmm, 
So if this protein called cystin one that is important to maintain pregnancy shares a few amino acid sequences with the spike protein, then it must mean that any vaccine against the spike protein must also act against cystin one and make a woman pregnant. It's almost like saying that because Kelechi and Edward uh, come from Africa, then it must mean that they share perfect identity from the crown of their heads to the soles of their feet. And nothing could be more wrong. Um, so the fact that this protein shares, you know, uh, a few amino acid sequences does not in any way mean that the anti and that the vaccines against the spike protein would work and make a woman um, 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 infertile. If anything, if anything, there were a number of women during the trials of the vaccines that actually became pregnant during the vaccine trials themselves. And sometimes people just overlook those facts because they're interested in pushing the wrong information. So I want to be very categorical that the vaccines do not cause infertility, but we know exactly how that myth came about. Thanks very much, Kelesh. I know you have to run. Thanks very much for your time. I know you you really contributed a lot, and I think we appreciate all your time. Thank, Thank you so much, Zed. Thank you. And bye-bye, Edward. Good to see you. Bye-bye. Right. Edward, we still have a bit of time. I'm told we can go until quarter two. So we have got another 10 or so minutes, and you might have to answer questions. So you are now in the hot seat. I just want you to, the next slide, to touch the, the subject. Next slide. Next slide. So I think one of the big areas is the broad subject of trust. If you can just briefly mention that, because it's not just about Black Africans. This is happening in, in Russia. This is happening. So there's a couple of slides that you have just to tell us about the broad area of trust affecting vaccine uptake. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, so absolutely uh, agree with uh, Kalechi that the the fundamental issue is is about trust and the vaccine hesitancy. We we have gone through uh, a process as 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 as, as populations, uh, and yes, the majority of people when the vaccines were first discussed, I think there was a poll that was done uh, here in the UK, and the vaccine hesitancy levels, well, mm -hmm. vaccine concerns, were very were, were quite high. I think it's important that in our dis discourse and discussion around vaccine hesitancy, we don't conflate it with the issues with regards to vaccine concerns. So vaccine hesitancy is when the vaccine is being offered to you. So I know the global distribution of the vaccines is such that there are some countries where the supply of vaccines uh, is still not where we want it to be. And it speaks to perhaps the question the wrong question that people ask around, was this vaccine rushed? I think the right question is, why did it take us so long in the past? Rather than why was this one rushed? Because it was not rushed. Uh, it was done because of the public health emergency. And I think if we treated all the other public health challenges with the sense of agency, we will be seeing new treatments coming through at that breaking, uh, breakneck speed. So I think the issue re regarding uh, the vaccine hesitancy, as Kelechi highlighted, is different for different populations. And it comes back to the question Zed raised around how useful it is for us to come up with analysis at uh, ethnicity or around ethnicity lines. The issues around vaccine hesitancy have to do with, can I trust the person who's telling me this is safe? Now, in the past, people used to trust doctors. They used to trust people in authority. But because of the misinformation and the constant bombardment that happened during the pandemic of lots and lots of information, it left people very confused. And so the reasons why people would have concerns around the vaccine were very, very varied. So within our communities, there were some who would hold on to the Tuskegee syphilis trial and say, look, isn't this another repeat? But also there were some who were spiritual reasons. And then there were some who were just the same as the general population who were worried about safety concerns. We did a very quick survey when we were vaccinating healthcare workers early in January within the hospital trust I work in. And the majority of people who were hesitant at that time 
were women of childbearing age. Their concerns were to do with the safety uh, with regards to their intentions of either planning for a family or actually being pregnant at the time and also included women who were breastfeeding. So even when we gave them the information, there was also an issue of trust to the point that the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology published a statement, which we know the way that that added to uh, the discourse like what Kelechi has highlighted. So we, we really cannot talk about increasing vaccine uptake without really understanding what are the issues uh, for these communities? What are the real issues? And being transparent and open and honest and having a dialogue and a discourse rather than us sitting in our health boards, in our hospitals and producing leaflets, thinking we are answering these the questions. For some people, it was something as simple as, well, I haven't seen any black person who has been vaccinated. So when we ran the campaigns and when we ran the community talks, I used to include pictures of myself. And I remember running a, 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 doing a talk for a group of guys I used to play Sunday football with, uh, predominantly from Zimbabwe. Uh, and they were saying, look, I don't understand all of this. It's too medical. Uh, and then one guy said at the end, there's one slide of your presentation that did it for me. And I thought, or oh, maybe it is about the randomized controlled trials. Maybe it is about the paper I had shared with them that was talking about the effectiveness of Pfizer. Or, but the one slide that did it for them was the slide when I was rolling up my sleeve and getting vaccinated. And this guy said, this is what did it for me. So sometimes we go with the wrong messages to the communities. We think evidence-based medicine. So let's go and tell them the randomized control trial, the study power, and actually the difference. And we talk about all these confusing epidemiological terms, when in actual fact, what they want is to see someone who looks like them, who speaks their language, who can talk to them in their mother language and say, you know what? There's nothing to worry about here. And for them, that's, that's what is enough. So we need to co-produce health with communities. Health is not produced in our board meetings. Health is not produced in our massive big strategies or in our vaccination programs. Health is produced when we co-produce with communities and we treat them with dignity and respect and value where they are coming from. Because for all we know, there's one guy who was very, 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 uh, very powerful in one of the meetings. He almost ended up disrupting the meeting. And he said, right, well, you said malinformation, misinformation. Well, actually, let me tell you something. What you're telling me is disinformation. So it, it then became a battle of the myths. Yours is a myth, mine is a myth. So whose myth is better? <laughs> so, so we really need to go back and really do the grassroots work that really work with communities. I often, I often talk about a court, which I, I wish it was mine, but it's not mine. And I'm still trying to find out where I got it from. But I'm from Zimbabwe, very, very much familiar with the drilling of wells and drilling of boreholes, because that's, that's the water supply uh, for the majority of our population. When you dig a well, when you drill a borehole, you drill it from the top, but it fills up from the bottom. If you just drill it from the top and it doesn't fill up, it becomes very dangerous. If it just fills from the bottom and there's no channel, then it's here today, gone tomorrow. And I think for me, that epitomizes how we need to co-produce with communities. The drilling from the top is all the evidence based, the resources and making things available, making vaccines available. The filling up from the bottom is working with communities so they understand the basis and giving them the opportunity for them to gain the trust and the confidence in whatever the intervention we're having. So I think for me, this is one example where we need to meet the communities and work with them. Vaccines don't really save lives. It's vaccination that saves lives. It's jabs in people's arms, not jabs in fridges. Thank you. Can we go to 58? I think we, we've got a few more minutes just to add. I think just to confirm your thing, I think I was thinking exactly like you on 58, is that it is data does not always resonate with people. This is actually from Swans, a lot of BAM groups that we're doing. If Webster is on the call, he's gonna kill me. That's the gentleman on the end there. Next slide. 
This is an important one. This is about the religious groups. And I know you you know Edward as well in terms of that. This is actually a very recent one about the work that was done in Nigeria. And we know that religious groups and religious leaders have been really big, particularly in terms of influencing people in Africa. And if you if you read this article, it was very influential that this gentleman is a huge following and it has made a big difference by him just telling his flock that they can vaccinate. This guy might have a C in biology at all level, but actually he's got a PhD from YouTube in terms of getting people to be vaccinated. Next slide. <clears throat> I just want to finish with that a little bit about what are other communities doing? And I think this is an important thing, particularly for links. And I just want to make a reference to the link that I did quite a bit of a, an interview with. Next slide. Because that's one of the things that came from Jane Hart's presentation is that we need to find ways of engaging and do a lot of work, but actually we need to engage with communities. I think Neocolo Network, for me, is doing it the right way. They've done some work with a link in Wales. They've got a partner in, in, in Senegal that they're working, and I feel there's genuine partnership. They're doing things in local languages where there's nuances in language and what is doing. They are using WhatsApp things. They are using visual animated clips. They're also using local doctors that are trusted. And all that seems to be working very well for me. So I think that's a very good example to go on. Next slide. I, I think we are very good sometimes at shouting and making noise, but I really like people who just get on and do something. We are trusted professionals. We can analyze and analyze. And I've got that quote, which I got from one of my colleagues that we can have analysis paralysis. We need to find ways of getting on and doing something. Next slide. Next slide. This is my last slide. Really, we, we shouldn't forget after all we are saying is that there's a lot of work we are doing, but by far the biggest problem for Africa is that the vaccines are not there. I agree that there's some hesitancy and things like that. When we started like in Zimbabwe, South Africa, there was hesitance. Now the hesitance seems to be going, but the vaccines are not there. So we really need to advocate to get the vaccines going. Edward, thank you very much. I don't know. We've only got three minutes for questions, if anything, or comments. So, Beth, over to you. I'm going to hand over to Claire, if that's okay. Unfortunately, I have childcare responsibilities that I need to get out the door to do. So, um, thank you both, and um, handing over to Claire, hopefully. Excellent. Okay, I think I'm on screen. So Beth has left the chat now. So I'm just going to take over the end of the session. So we have had a few questions in the box, and I'm going to take them one by one. Um, I'm going to start with a question from one of your colleagues, potentially from the Wales and African Health Links Network, although they haven't put their name in the box is um, a question that to, I think mainly for you, Zed, and it might have been towards Kelchi before he left, the vaccine hesitancy chart had no African countries on it. Um, are there any specific comments to be made around African countries? Um, and then I'm going to go, can I actually give you two questions and then you can come back to them? Fine, yeah. And then we've had a question from Rupert Mark Allen, um, who has said, um, as a rough estimate, what would you estimate the nature-nurture proportions of BAME vulnerability to be at present, i.e. can culture um, versus genetic risk, and can, should this concept be correlated to social versus vaccination methods of mitigation? So they're the two questions for now, and then I'll come back to any more if we get through those ones on time. I mean... I'm not an expert on that. I know there's one vaccine that definitely had some of the research which was done in South Africa. The Johnson & Johnson had a leg and a significant recruitment in South Africa. But other than that, I don't have a lot of information about a lot of other research. But I know that within America, one of the reasons why the Moderna one was delayed is because at some stage, I think the, the researchers did pause and say that there wasn't enough African-Americans in that, in that particular 
vaccine study and they did recruit a little bit more. So there is an effort to do that, but uh, there just isn't enough of research happening in Africa, partly because there isn't institutions that are robust enough to take on. But I know that South Africa has been involved. I don't know if Edward knows anymore. <clears throat> Yeah, so there were a number uh, of other trials uh, for, for a different type of vaccine. So certainly in the Northern African part uh, of Africa, there were a number of countries that participated in the sign of um, vaccination trials. Um, but yeah, I agree, not enough was done uh, in terms of recruiting those countries. And I think it's one of those things that because of the mistrust and those French researchers who were very irresponsible in their comments, uh, even if the uh, offer was extended, uh, and I'm not so sure it was, but even if it was extended, I think participation in those trials uh, would have been very, very patchy. So I think a lot needs to be done to re to address some of the historical failings uh, in terms of research, biomedical research, uh, in terms of uh, international programs, uh, vaccination programs as well. Uh, there are a number of cases which if we had time we would have talked about, uh, that were done um, perhaps negligently uh, by so-called health professionals. So, so I think I think this should open up the discourse around how do we engage communities to participate in research and assure them that actually you're not participating in a research that is you are not the guinea pig, uh, but actually these things are safety mechanisms and things get stopped if there are concerns. So yeah, there were a few more countries, but not enough. Uh, would, would be my comment on that one. I, did, I didn't quite understand the second one. What I'll show, you, I'll pop the question on the screen, Zed, so that you can see it. Can you let me know, can you see? Um, it was originally posed to Dr. Kelchi, but I'm sure either one of you would probably be able to pick up on some of the points. So I think it goes back to the original debate very early on. It was about kind of exposure to um, were perhaps black minority ethnic communities yeah. being exposed more or was it genetic predisposition? I remember that being a debate very early on. So I yeah. suppose it's just where our learning has taken us since then. I think, I mean, I'm sure uh, Edward will comment, but broadly we know that there is no genetic predisposition that make you more likely to die from COVID-19 just because you're a black person. There's a lot of genetic predisposition related to specific diseases, both in blacks and Asians in terms of type 2 diabetes and all of those things. And if those conditions are not managed well, we know that they add the risk much higher. But there's no specific genetic predisposition where it is. We know there's been clusters in families, but that is both in Caucasian and white people, where you get maybe a partner and somebody else dying themselves. But usually there's other risks as well. I don't know if Edward has anything to add to that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. So there is a paper that was uh, published in the BMJ. I'll put I'll put the link into the chat uh, that talks about the different layers uh, that made it possible for COVID nineteen to display the pattern that it displayed, uh, and they did not happen by chance. They are structural determinants of health at, at the at the fundamental level, and and I think the discourse around the role of culture, the role of individuals. Uh, can be a distraction. Uh, and we have seen in other public health challenges where the movement away from addressing what Michael Marmot calls the causes of the causes distracts and starts to point fingers at individuals. And, and that then passes the responsibility to individuals as if they would have the resources and the power and the control to eliminate that risk. You talk about the obesity agenda and people saying it's about what you eat. Of course it is. But ultimately, what determines what ends up on your plate has got nothing to do with what you eat. And ultimately, that's what then drives this. So the paper talks about the different layers, uh, the different uh, levels of vulnerability by uh, the long-term conditions, the differentials in exposures. So we know right at the outset of this, politicians, celebrities came out and said, we are in this together. Nothing could be further from the truth. The COVID-19 pandemic, we were never in it together. And yes, it is a global pandemic, but our ability to practice the mitigation was not uniformly distributed. So there are some people who came into this pandemic already battling some other storms. There's a guy who was the chair of the Runnymede Trust, which is a big advocacy and poverty uh, charity here in the UK. 
Uh, and, and he came up with this that has always stuck in my mind, which is that uh, we are not in the same storm and we don't all have the same boats. And, and, and so it basically says COVID-19 is a storm. We are not in it together. Some people have got, uh, basically, they were fighting storms before they came into this, uh, which made it easier for them to catch the, the disease and for them to succumb to the infection. Some people, the moment we're told to work from home, some people could work from home. Well, actually, for a start, you're assuming I have a home. What about if I'm homeless? What about if, if I'm living with an abusive partner? And I think colleagues in Wales should be commended for your health impact assessment. If you haven't seen that, read the Public Health Wales Health Impact Assessment, which talks about the disproportionate impacts of the COVID pandemic on mental health, on some communities that came into this already battling some other storms. So I don't think it's anything to do with the nature, as Zed has already said, talked about. That can be a distraction. The real issue is we could have predicted we can predict who will come out worse in this, especially those who, people who were already battling so many different storms created by the conditions in which they are born, conditions in which they live, conditions in which they age, and sadly end up dying. Thank you. I think we'll probably have to end it then. Um, yeah, we had one more question, and unfortunately for Catherine, who is the chair of Wales Africa Health Links Network, we're not going to get to it, but I know she obviously has a direct route to you all to be able to ask that question. We will ask it on the desk, on the on the networking from five o'clock. We can have a chat about that, I'm sure. Exactly, exactly. Thank you both for um, taking us through so much pertinent information this afternoon. I'm not sure if I've got a trustee other than you on the call, Zed. So I don't know if you want to make any summarising remarks and then I'll run the polls. Do we have any poll? I can do those at the end, yep, if you want to. I'm going to set the polls up, um, which we'd invite you all to respond to um, in order to give us some feedback so we know how to plan our sessions in the future and respond well to the Wales and Africa um, community. But in the meantime, Zed, if you want to make some summary. Well, I just want to say thanks to Edward for your time. And I know I've... I would want to say the same to Kalech. Also tell people that we can still put questions and answers in the networking session. We will be at the desk where I am and we can try and address that and we'll read all the questions as much as possible. And um, so I think thank you to everybody that joined the, the session. Um, I'm just going to leave this session open for a couple of seconds then to get everybody to respond to these polls. Um, we would encourage you after this session to go to remain on screen if you're not too kind of exhausted by looking at screen this afternoon because we're going to have networking afterwards, which we'd welcome you to all join um, and be able to talk and debrief about the conference generally for the day. Um, I'm just going to stay here for one or two more minutes whilst we wait for the results to come through um, and then we'll close the session. Um, it's always difficult on these calls, isn't it, to kind of manage all the different things happening on screen at any given moment. So apologies to the participants. Okay, we've had some responses through. So I'm just gonna give it a few more seconds. Okay, we are gonna try and capture the reality of a conference during our informal session. Um, I know most people will hang around the doors before they disappear back to their day jobs and lives and actually have a, a good opportunity to have a chin wag with people that they haven't seen for a while. So that's the intention of the next session. Um, our polls have been completed. I'm not seeing any more votes coming through on those. Just gonna give it one more second. And then, okay, I'm going to end the session. Thank you both so much for this afternoon. Okay, thanks, um, Edward. We'll be back tomorrow morning for more sessions. So follow the link and everyone enjoy the informal networking. <laughs>